Hi, everybody. Welcome to Patriots History of the United States. I'm the co-author of Patriots History, Larry Swikart, with Mike Allen. And um, as always, I am reading from the 15th anniversary edition, the 41st printing. We're in our 41st printing. If you have an earlier edition, you should be okay down to about the 10th. Before the 10th, things get a little hairy because we rearranged a lot in terms of pages. You can usually find things by the header. And right now, the header I'm using is the restless spirit in chapter six, the perils and promise of Jackson's America. Um, so I am <clears throat> on page 201. 201. Let me briefly check something. Okay, we're good. I just wanted to make sure that I didn't have any new material that has been added to the 20th anniversary edition, which is uh, what I will be posting on the website free sometime early next year. Um, it will probably come after the release of Patriots History of Globalism because we want to make sure that that book gets out there to everybody who needs it, everybody who wants to find it. All right, special offer before we get going here. If you go to either the Wild World of History or the Wild World of Politics sites and you subscribe to the VIP service in history, $69 a year, and uh, it's got five ongoing lesson programs, all in video, total of almost 40 hours of video on such lessons as Reagan, uh, An American Life, um, Integrity with Winston Churchill, The 1620 Default, Why the 1619 Project is Wrong, Horrible History of Howard Zinn, a lot, 40 some videos at least, 40 hours worth. And it's got all of my lessons from almost two years of Wild Wednesday webcasts, where I would do a different historical topic every Wednesday night, such things as UFOs in history, prohibition, was it popular, um, the Roaring Twenties, uh, Custer's Last Stand, I mean, all sorts of things. And all 40 of those are available. That's about 35 hours worth of video instruction. And you also get six of my very best lessons from the curriculum. So you get a total of, I don't know, almost 80 hours worth of videos. But in addition, you sign up for the VIP now. I will add in a free, a free copy of Patriots History of the United States, autographed and shipped. Same thing for Wild World of Politics Insider. There are some different videos over on that side, including my newest one, Globalism, Then and Now but also some overlap like the Reagan series. Uh, again, access to all of my uh, Wednesday night webcasts. Uh, more politically leaning, you get access to my Larry's commentary three days a week, which is fresh topic driven commentary. So either one, subscribe now and I'll get you a free copy of a Patriots History of the United States autograph. All right, we have been in Chapter six, the promise and perils of Jacksonian America. And I want to just say a few words before we move on about John Fitch, because he's unfortunately overlooked. Uh, people always think that Robert Fulton invented the steamboat. He did not. John Fitch invented the steamboat. And Fitch's steamboat was really interesting looking. He had a steam-driven railing that ran along the top of the boat about, about head high. And driving this railing were wheels that turned paddles. So the paddles on each side, right? Let me do it this way. Uh -huh. There we go. The paddles on each side would pull the boat through the water. Um, the problem was, as I said when I read this last time, he got a charter on the Delaware River, which <clears throat> was easy to navigate, easy to sail, and had <clears throat> roads running along each bank. In other words, competition there 
was cheap. It, it was easy for people to compete with something other than a steamboat. And, and he went out of business and his last boat was wrecked during a storm and he committed suicide. Well, Robert Fulton, who'd been in France, was hanging around with um, a, a couple at the consulate and he got to meet William Livingston of New York, who had a lot of political pull. And Fulton was a great idea man. He had great ideas. He created these beautiful drawings of aqueducts and and skyscrapers in, in early 1800. I mean, the guy was quite brilliant, but he wasn't too practical. And um, so he and Livingston worked out a deal whereby he would get a charter to do business on the Hudson River. Now, the Hudson was not nearly as easy to navigate and did not have the roads going up each side. In other words, <clears throat> Fulton, unlike Fitch, was offering a service that no one else could match. So eventually he came to dominate the river. Now, as you know, the Claremont had paddle wheels on each side rather than the, the oars paddling like that. Um, and he uh, took it very seriously and, uh, and offered first class accommodations to the extent that was possible on an early steamboat like that. So what Fulton did was he was a master marketer and businessman. Fitch was the inventor. All right. The steamboat was so important because once you got steam power in boats, it was only a matter of time before you got steam power elsewhere. In uh, 1825, uh, England had opened its first railroad George Stevenson's rocket and the rocket rocketed along at a grand total of about two or three miles an hour and literally people stood stood in a uh, kind of open cabin there was no place for him to sit and so forth and um, the railroad in England so threatened the buggy makers there and the um steamship companies they, they england didn't have the same river system we did but mainly the buggy makers um that they got a law in england requiring for safety purposes you had to walk ahead of the train with a light waving a light even in daytime which further limited it, its speed right <clears throat> now paul johnson the great british historian argues that the um, railroad business in England worked hand in glove with other industries there to dampen down an early car business, particularly worked with the carriage business, obviously a direct competitor. And his point was that we could have had cars in England probably by the mid 1800s, had it not been for this collusion between the English railroad industry and the English carriage industry. Kind of an interesting thought. All right, so we are now on page 201. <clears throat> Steam technology also provided the basis for another booming American industry when Philip Thomas led a group of Baltimore businessmen to found the Baltimore and Ohio b &O Railroad, if you ever played Monopoly, in 1828. Two years later, the South Carolina Canal and Railroad Company began a steam locomotive train service westward from Charleston with its locomotive, Best Friend of Charleston, being the first constructed for sale in the United States. <clears throat> so you can see we're... We're not too far behind England right now. They get the first railroad in 1825. By 1825, we've, 1828, we've got a railroad. We're already building our own locomotives. The king of American locomotive building was Matthias Baldwin, who made his first locomotive in 1832, founded the Baldwin Engine and Locomotive Works. His firm turned out more than 1,500 locomotives during his lifetime including many for export. 
Within a few years, contemporaries were referring to a railroad building as a fever, a frenzy, or a mania. There were enormous positive social consequences of better transportation. For example, by linking Orange County, New York, and the leading Derry County in New York to New York City, the railroad contributed to the reduction of milk-borne diseases like cholera by supplying fresh milk. By 1840, most states had railroads, although the Atlantic seaboard states had more than 60% of total rail mileage. Like the canals, many railroads received state backing. Some were constructed by individual entrepreneurs, but the high capital demands of the railroads, combined with the public's desire to link up every burg by rail, led to states taking a growing role in the financing of American railroads. Railroad size and scope of operations required vast amounts of capital compared to textile mills or ironworks. This dynamic forced them to adopt a new structure in which the multiple stockholder owners selected a professional manager to run the firm. By the 1840s, banks and railroads were inextricably linked not only through the generation of capital, but also through the new layer of professional managers, many of them put in place by the banks that own the railroad stock positions. So here's, here's how it works. Railroads cost so much that it was almost impossible for a single person, usually a man, single man, to <clears throat> fund a railroad by himself or with just a handful of rich partners like you could a bank. So to get the money, they had to print stock and sell stock. What is stock? Stock is a share of ownership. Currently I bought Unicoin. It's stock shares in a digital coin company. I am part owner of a digital coin company. Um, at one time, way back when, um, I used to own shares in the Milwaukee Bucks basketball team back when Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, then known as Lou Alcindor, played for the Bucks. Um, so a stock is a share of ownership. A bond is a loan. If you have U.S. government bonds in your portfolio, this means that the you are lending the U.S. government money, and at a future date, it will pay you back that money and then some for your trouble, called interest. Okay, bonds on the whole um, aren't too volatile; they don't go up and down too fast because they're very long term city or municipal bonds, railroad bonds, canal bonds tended to be for long periods of time, five to 20 years. Hence, the name of many of these bonds was a 520, a, a bond that went for 20 years and paid 5% interest at the end of 20 years. Stocks, on the other hand, go up, go down, go up, go up because you're part of an owner. I mean, you're an owner. So if it goes broke, you lose whatever you put into that stock, but nothing more. But if it does really, really well, the value of your stock goes up, and usually they pay dividends or a part of the profits thanking you for participating in the company. The second thing about the railroads, they were vast. They crossed many times county lines and quite often state lines. This created a problem for a single owner because the wider and broader your operations got, the harder it was for you to control them or have any sense of control, even with a telegraph. Don't forget, they didn't have telephones in, let alone cell phones. They were still using the telegraph, and that didn't even come about till 1848. So how are you going to send messages or control railroads, trains that are on the tracks and moving, if, say, <clears throat> you're in New York City and the train is headed to Cincinnati. 
more important, what happens if somehow, some way, you get some sort of message, let's say it's a telegraph is around and you get a, a wire and it says a train has been deployed on the same track and will hit your someplace near West Virginia. How do you control that? You can't. So the scale of the railroads, that is their cost, the size of the railroads expanding across multiple, multiple territories, and the speed of the railroads. Railroads now were the fastest thing on earth. <laughs> Hard for us to believe because nobody thinks of a railroad unless you're on the bullet train there with Brad Pitt. Uh, nobody thinks of a, a train as being that fast. But back then they were super fast. And again, it became a safety issue because as you got more and more trains, it became easier and easier to screw up and put two trains going opposite directions on the same track, or even one going faster than the other on the same track. <clears throat> and there were big accidents, big accidents at this time. So this led to the stockholders, the owners, <clears throat> not one of whom could run the company, saying we need to set up a governance of the company under a professional manager. So I know you think you know what a big business is. Or oh, that's in any business that has a lot of people working for it. Well, no, not actually. And a small business isn't necessarily a business that only has a few people working for it. The technical definition of a big business is one in which the owners up here hire a professional manager down here to run the company. Or put another way, a little more technically, there is a separation between ownership at the top and management below them. The managers were paid by the owners and usually paid well. And they could get stock or ownership in the company. But very few people could own enough stock to control the whole company. There's exceptions. Carnegie and his steel company was a small business. Even though it was the biggest steel maker in the world, it was a small business because he ran it from the top. He was the owner. He was the manager. Okay. Um, but let's say your parents have a small computing and internet firm. And let's say that they own it, but technology's just gotten so out of control, they no longer feel capable of really running it on a daily basis. So they hire a manager. Well, let's say you've only got three employees. Your whole company might only be six or seven people, doesn't matter. Once you hire a manager who works under the owners, it's a big business, no matter how small it is. And no matter how big it is, as long as the owner is still running it, like Ford did with Ford Auto Company up until World War II, it's a small business. So the railroads, on average, were rapidly becoming big business because they needed those managers to run the railroads. And one manager would set up multiple departments underneath him, such as purchasing, okay? He didn't wanna be in charge of going out and looking at every single locomotive or piece of rolling stock. So he would set up a department under a manager, a director of purchasing, who would go out and purchase stuff. And you might have a sales department, What's their job? Well, you know, selling stuff. So the CEO, the chief operating officer or chief executive officer would run the company through many other specific managers. And you might even have managers below them, sub-managers, vice president for cornflakes, whatever it is. Okay, so this is called a managerial hierarchy, 
hierarchy because it goes up, right? That's what the railroads brought to America was a change in the way you do business. I'll have more to say on this later because it's very, very important. By the 1840s, banks and railroads were inexorably linked, not only through the generation of capital, but also through the new layer of professional managers, many of them put in place by the banks that own the majority stock position. So again, if the bank is setting up all the funding for a railroad, a bank might demand, we want Joe Blow over here to run this railroad because we know we can trust him. He may not be the railroad's choice, but that's irrelevant. As transportation improved, communications networks also proliferated. Banks could evaluate the quality of private banknote issues, that is money, through something called Dilliston's Bank Note Reporter, which was widely circulated. You go into almost any bank in America in the 1840s, and they would have a recent copy of Dilliston's Bank Note Reporter, and it would say... Um, First Bank of Charleston notes are trading at a 3% discount, meaning a dollar note, they will pay you 97 cents for a dollar note from the Bank of Charleston. Why the difference, you ask? Because the bankers then, after collecting the note from the Bank of Charleston, let's say you're in Augusta, Georgia, you have to take all those Bank of Charleston notes at the end of the day, wrap them up, and mail or ship them back to the Bank of Charleston, and that costs money. So you would discount the money and make your, your costs up there. Dillistons would tell you how much to discount the notes. The Cincinnati-based Bradstreet Company provided similar evaluation of businesses themselves. Um, this is a remarkable story because it involved Arthur and Lewis Tappan, T-A-P-P-A-N, who ran a New York company called the Mercantile Company. And as the name would imply, they sold clothing, umbrellas, shoes and boots, belts, things like that. And they did not offer credit. But when the Panic of 1837 hit, they were almost bankrupt. And they found to attract more customers, they had to offer credit. Now, their real mission in life, as they saw it, was to free slaves. They were abolitionists. And they had a secret society of Christian reporters who would tell them about slaves who were hiding out who needed to be transported to Upper New York or wherever it was. <clears throat> um, these Christian spies would also tell them about gambling going on or brothels or any unseemly behavior. It was a very moralistic moral police, right? Well, when the panic hit, the Tappan's Mercantile Company had to offer credit. But they've never offered credit before, so how do they know who is a good credit risk? They asked their spies to do less spying about people's morality and more spying about their finances and whether or not they were a good credit risk. And soon they developed what were called correspondence or letter writers all around the country who would send them reports for a small fee um, on who was a good credit risk, let's say in Cincinnati, Ohio, Memphis, Tennessee, Springfield, Illinois. And you know who ended up being a correspondent from Springfield, Illinois, a guy named Abraham Lincoln. And you know who got a report written about him on one of these reports was Ulysses S. Grant. Gave him a very good report. Say so he doesn't have any money, but he's got excellent character. And so 
then the Tappans would take all these reports, all these letters, bundle them up, or make copies of them, which I had to do by hand, and sell them to any other businesses in town that offered credit. And so when they merged with this Bradstreet and Company, the name changed to Dun and Bradstreet. And it was one of the biggest credit reporting companies in the entire world up until about 1900. All right. Let's see. Cincinnati-based Bradstreet Company provided similar evaluation of businesses themselves. Investor knowledge benefited from the expansion of the U.S. Post Office, which had more than 18,000 branches by 1850, one for every 1,300 people. Congress had direct stake in the post office in the congressional apportionment was based on population and since constituents clamored for new routes there was a built-in bias in favor of expanding the postal network most routes did not even bear more than one percent of their costs that is the post office was always broke but that was irrelevant given the political gains they represented in addition to their value and apportionment, the postal branches offered legislators a free election tool. Congressmen shipped speeches and other election materials to constituents free. This is called the franking privilege. You can, if you make a speech in Congress, the law is you can send it free to all your constituents. Okay? So they were able, politicians were able to use the post office to advance their careers. Partisan concerns also link post office branches and the party controlled newspapers by reducing the cost of distribution through the mails. That is, they worked out a deal in Congress because the newspapers were totally in the back pocket of either political party. Back then it was mostly the Democrats. <clears throat> So they worked out a deal so you could ship newspapers through the mail at the same cost as anything else. But a newspaper was heavier, right? Didn't matter. So this is another way that politicians were able to expand the newspaper business. So that by the 1840s, there were newspapers everywhere, and almost all of them were tied to one political party or the other. Okay, so watch this. Americans read more and more newspapers. What do you know about a newspaper? It's the stories are short, right? I mean, they're no more than a column. <clears throat> what do you know about a book? big. So Americans became more and more readers of newspapers and less and less readers of books. A giant shift in how Americans read occurred during this era. And it, another giant shift has occurred since about 2000 with the advent of television, cable television, and most recently the internet and internet news sites so that people don't read newspapers anymore. They're all going broke because you're all reading your news here on a screen someplace. More likely, not even a big screen, more likely one of these. All right, let's finish this section. From 1800 to 1840, the number of newspapers tra transmitted throughout the mails rose from 2 million to 140 million at far cheaper rates than other printed matter. Postal historian Richard John estimated that if the newspapers had paid the same rate as other mails, the transmission cost would have been 700 times higher. So they were getting a 700-fold cost break by shipping newspapers through the mail. 
The new party system by 1840 had thus compromised the independence of the males and a large part of the print media with no small consequences. Among other defects, the subsidies created incentives to read newspapers rather than books. We talked about this. This democratization of the news produced a population of people who thought they knew a great deal about current events, but who also lacked theoretical foundation in history, philosophy, or politics to properly ground their opinions. As the number of U.S. post office branches increased, the post office itself came to wield considerable clout, and the position of postmaster became a political plum. There were kids who wanted to grow up and be postmaster because it was a great job. You control thousands of other jobs. It's very powerful. Postmaster General alone controlled more than 8,700 jobs, more, patron, more than three-fourths of all the federal civilian workforce, larger than even the Army. Patronage explained the ability of companies receiving federal subsidies to repel challenges from the private sector, allowing the subsidized postal companies to defeat several private expresses in the 1830s. So if you wonder, why did we get a government post office and not a whole bunch of little FedExes? This is why, subsidies. <clears throat> the remarkable thing about the competition to the subsidized mails was not that it lasted so long and did not resurface until Fred Smith founded Federal Express in 1971, but that it even appeared in the first place. This is particularly noteworthy given that the federal government aggressively pursued criminal action against competitors to protect the government's postal monopoly and the delivery of non-urgent letters. So the government was would go after you if you tried to compete with the post office. All right, that's a good place to stop. I will not be here Friday. I will be leading a tour of the Reagan Ranch and the Reagan Library. Probably won't be back Wednesday. Maybe if I get here in time, if I get back home in time to uh, do this show on Wednesday. Otherwise, you won't see me again until um, a week from this Friday. All right. See you later.